Sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern. This week on Wall Street Wrap-Up, the Federal Reserve raises interest rates an additional one-half a percent in the last meeting of the year. The stock market with fears of hard recession sell off. Will there be a Santa Claus rally this year, or are we going to get a lump of coal in our stockings? And the Consumer Price Index for November was released, and inflation was better than expected. But the stock market still is worried about hard recession or maybe stagflation. I'm Andre Laborde. We've got these stories and more. It's Friday. That means it's time for Wall Street Wrap-Up. Hi, I'm Andre Laborde. Welcome to Wall Street Wrap-Up on this Friday, December the 16th, 2022. Well, coming up tonight, we'll be talking with about higher interest rates, inflation, how to invest in 2023 with Morgan Stanley Managing Director and Principal of the Spiro Group, Jim Spiro. With over 40 years of experience as a wealth advisor and $2.8 billion of assets under management, well, if we're headed into a recession, how do we position our portfolios? Jim Spiro is going to be coming up. Well, today was a massive expiration of options trading in the stock market that's known as the triple witching. Now, this occurs triple witching on the third Friday of each month. Now, what made this different was it was not only the last third Friday of the month, it was also the last of the year. Four trillion dollars of options expired. Traders are settling their positions. But now, what does that mean to your 401k or your Roth IRA? Now, over the long term, means absolutely nothing. But this was a small portion of the volatility of the market today and for the week. But so how did the markets do this week? Well, as of the close of the day, Disney shares, since Bob Iger has retaken the CEO suite, fell and is on pace now as having the worst year since 1974. Stocks closed negative for the second week in a row. All the indexes were down for today. The Dow Jones ended the week at 32,910, which was down 1.6% for the week. The S&P 500, they closed the day at 3851, which was down just over 2% for the week. And the NASDAQ, they ended today at 10,705, down just over 2.7% for the week. The Bureau of Labor Statistics this week released the inflation numbers for November for their CPI. November's consumer price index rose to just over 7% for the year, which was better news than expected. And for the month, that rose one-tenth of 1%. The core CPI, which measures without volatility of food and energy, that rose 6% for the year and two-tenths of a percent for November. So how does that relate to cost of goods and services? Well, the good news that prices were down for the year, it was gas at the pumps were down. Transportation was also down just over 1%. Airfare, which travelers are going to take advantage of for this Christmas season, will be down about 3% from last year. Now, the bad news, heading higher, were led by food costs. That was increasing over 10.5% over the year. New vehicles increased over 7%, and home rent increased over 7% since 2021. And the authorities in the Bahamas arrested former FTX founder and one-time CEO Sam Bankman-Fried this week and will eventually extradite him back into the United States. At present, he's being locked in a Bahaman jail and denied bail because of a, being a flight risk. He requested bail also due to his vegan diet. And the jail in the Bahamas, well, they just don't have vegan diets. At the beginning of the year, FTX, the company he founded and was the one-time CEO, was valued at $32 billion. And just as past November the 7th, he said all the assets are fine, nothing to worry about. And uh, this week, the Bahaman police have arrested him and presently denied him bail for being a possible flight risk. He's being charged in the United States with conspiracy to commit wire fraud, wire fraud on customers, conspiracy to commit wire fraud on lenders, and wire fraud on lenders.
Well, let's get to our guest this evening to help us figure out just what's going on in the markets this week. Jim Spiro is Managing Director at Morgan Stanley. He's been named as Forbes Magazine Best In-State Wealth Advisor, and Barron's has named him one of the top 100 wealth advisors in the country, and he's here with us tonight. Hi, Jim. Welcome back to Wall Street Wrap-Up. Hi, Andre. It's nice to be here. How are you? Jim, what a what a week this was in the, in yes. the stock market. I mean, we had the FOMC raised interest rates, uh, the consumer price index, the CPI came out for November's numbers. Yeah. What are your thoughts for this week? Well, you know, as I've told you, Andre, even though this week was a, a very uh, impactful week, as you suggested, a lot of data came out. I don't spend a lot of time looking week to week. Uh, I found that's actually uh, counterproductive to the management of a long-term uh, uh, portfolio, and a portfolio should be long-term. But I think to try to address your question to some extent, obviously uh, interest rates have come up a bit more, uh, and that reflects the Fed's point of view that they want to do whatever they have to do to stamp out inflation. Uh, one is that you see an enormous inversion in the yield curve. The yield curve I'm referring to simply plots U.S. Treasury maturities uh, and what kind of return they offer vis-a-vis uh, the uh, uh, maturity. Generally, it's a positively sloped thing, Andre, in the sense that the longer you go out in maturity, the higher the return you get. Mm -hmm. And that's to compensate for the fact that generally the longer term you hold something, you want to be compensated appropriately. You want to receive more return. Right now, we have an inversion where not only is the two-year paying more than the 10-year security, which we had briefly in the spring before it righted itself, and we've had for some time now, but you actually have a three-month treasury paying more than a 10-year treasury. And that's generally a pretty good indicator, not always, but a pretty good indicator that a recession is likely to come. And that's not the end of the world either. The business cycle hasn't been repealed. We've had them before and we'll have them again. But what it does, uh, I think, cause people uh, uh, to consider Consider or should consider is that if, if the Fed is basically making progress with respect to stamping out inflation, it's because the global economy, and more specifically the U.S. economy, is slowing. Jim, when, when there is an, a, an inverted yield curve, such as yeah. what you're talking about, where yeah. the two-year Treasury is paying more than the 30-year Treasury, which yeah. would be an oddity, and a red flag of a recession will be coming, is there normally a uh, within... X amount of time? Are we looking at, you think, uh, normally within a six-month period, within a 10-month period, or what's the time frame? Yeah, you're asking a wonderful question, and I just want to make sure that you realize uh, the inversion is actually a little bit more pronounced. It's not only two over 30, it's two over 10, mm -hmm. two over five, and two over three month. If you go back and look at the last, I don't know how many recessions we've had in this country, certainly for the last 40 or 50 years, you will find that every recession is preceded by an inverted yield curve. However, every inverted yield curve is not always followed by a recession. So it's a red flag, as you said, no more than that. It's not a slam dunk. What you do find, Andre, is that these things generally last. You know, the, the pandemic was really an anomaly because it was a V. I mean, things collapsed and then came back very, very rapidly because of the unprecedented fiscal and monetary stimulus. But you do find that these things generally seem to have an average duration of around two years. But the more important thing, I think, for perhaps for your viewers, is that if you go back and look over the last many, many decades, you will see that uh, we've had about 24 or so rate hiking cycles since about the early 70s, which is what the Fed has been in now, a period of time where they're raising interest rates. But again, from the first uh, rate increase, look out about a year later, the average is about 8 percent higher and two years 15 percent higher. And what that speaks to, Andre, is the uh, foolishness of trying to time markets and also the fact that the market uh, generally will move well in advance of the anecdotal evidence that will be provided that suggests the recession is coming to an end. So, you know, people need to understand that by the time they read the headline that says, recession ends, exclamation mark, good times ahead, question mark, the stock market will have already likely meaningfully moved higher from whatever level it, it, it started from. But that's because markets move well in advance on the way up and on the way down. Markets are anticipatory beasts, not reactive beasts. Right. Well, do you think, is it possible that are we in a recession right now? And we'll well, see it in the rearview mirror? You know, certainly if you look at the labor force, we're not in a recession. Wages have been right. coming up nicely, and the, the labor force is still extremely tight. 
how sort of people feel, and I think a lot of this is is uh, 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 pronounced by the 24-hour news cycle and the fact that most of what makes uh, makes it on the news these days is pervasively negative. I'd say there's sort of a dour tone that's been uh, uh, pervasive throughout the country. The economy clearly is slowing down. There's no question about that. You see commodities prices, particularly energy prices, have come down rather sharply. It's hard to be upbeat when you have a, a, a war of the magnitude that we're seeing in Europe. So I don't know about denotatively. I think it's a borderline question. But connotatively, yes, I would say so. They reported that the Atlanta Fed said that looks like next year that they're predicting a 3.4 percent growth in the economy. Do you think that the Atlanta Fed is correct when they say that they're thinking of a 3.4 percent growth? But if they are, does this also mean that the Fed has to also increase interest rates? Because just like what you said, they do want to slow down the economy to stop the rate of inflation. The Atlanta Fed, obviously, you know, the, 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 the people on that uh, board are extremely bright people, and they have access to the, uh, you know, the most current and most uh, uh, detailed uh, economic material. So who am I to question them? That's above the forecast that I've seen from just about every uh, source, but perhaps they're right. Hopefully they will be. In order to generally really get inflation under control, uh, the federal funds rate, which is now whatever it is in the low to mid fours, uh, has to exceed uh, uh, the rate of inflation. Now, we can argue where inflation is, uh, you know, some say the core is six, some say it's five, the, fer uh, the Fed has its own, uh, its own ways of measuring it, but it's still in excess of the federal funds rate. So I think the Fed still has more work to do. I think the Fed has come to the conclusion that the current level of employment, uh, uh, unemployment rather, which is about 3.7 percent, is simply inconsistent with a 2 percent uh, rate of inflation. And in order for those two things to uh, coexist, uh, then, then uh, the Fed will not achieve uh, its goals. So one of them is going to have to give, and I think you will see that the Fed is going to raise rates or at least keep them at an elevated level to get uh, inflation closer to two. I don't know that they'll make two, but as a consequence, I think the rate of unemployment will have to come up, not insubstantially, not a couple of tenths of a percentage point. It would seem to me that that rate of return or that rate of growth in the economy would be tough to achieve. Do you think stocks are, have, be, have dropped so much that they've become more attractive now? Well, I'm not a timer, but people need to understand this is a really an anomalous year uh, because stocks are down sharply and likely to finish up the year in the negative, and bonds are likely to finish up the year in the negative. They both have improved from their nadirs, whatever it was, six, eight weeks ago, but they're both likely to finish in the negative. If that happens, Andre, that will be the first time in 53 years, since 1969, that both have finished in the negative. Now, if you think about all the things that we, we, we've gone through since 69, you've had the resignation of a president, the attempted assassination of a president, 9-11, the tech bubble, uh, the war now, uh, uh, the collapse in 08, COVID. For, for a statement like that to still be true, that this has not happened in the last 53 years, gives you an idea of the degree of anomaly that's taken place. That said, if you're asking me where the market's going to be in the next month or three months or four months or six months, I'm agnostic. I don't know. And the truth is nobody else knows either, no matter how convincing someone may tell you that he or she uh, uh, is uh, or, or believes, uh, nobody knows, uh, because that presupposes an ability to look into the future. But what I would tell you is that if you go back over 30, 50, 100 years, you will see that through good times and bad, whether you pick any of those time frames, the average rate of return has been about 8.5 to 9 percent through all of those time periods. And that includes, as we know, a lot of rough times, far rougher than we're going through right now. Uh, I don't think that trend is likely to be broken in the coming years. Year here, year there, I'm not smart enough to know. I do know things have come down a good long ways, and I, good, I do know that interest rates are coming down, and it may take some time for the seeds to be uh, sown and ultimately uh, a sprout, but these are generally the kinds of markets where at least you might want to begin to consider accumulating, and if things get weaker, accumulate more, and weaker still accumulate more. So I'm not a timer, and I always realize that once I put a foot in the water, I need to be prepared to follow it up if things get worse. Uh, but you can't underestimate the fact that things have come down a good long ways, and if you look at that in conjunction with the historical behavior of the stock market, people's antennas should be going up. Yeah. 
Jim, why is it when it comes to bonds, like what you just mentioned, um, both this year looks like for the first time in 53 years, both yeah. the stock and the bond market will be ending lower. Normally, and correct me if I'm wrong, but normally if stocks are up, bonds are not. And inversely, when the stock market goes down, it's a great time for bonds. But this time they're both down. Why is that? Well, the reason why the reason they normally there's a yin and a yang is generally when the economy is robust, there's a great deal of demand for credit. Uh, things are blowing and going, and as a consequence, uh, interest rates are generally either stable or rising to reflect the degree of economic growth. That's not to say there's rampant inflation, but they're generally not pegged to the floor as we've had for the last several years. Uh, and as a consequence, you know bond prices and interest rates move inversely. So a higher rate environment is generally adverse for bonds. And if you flip the coin around, when the stock market is doing poorly, the general response is for the Federal Reserve to cut interest rates. And there are some other things that go on, but that's the general uh, first line in the sand. And when that happens, bonds respond nicely, again, because of the inverse relationship between interest rates and bonds. This year is highly unusual, and that's uh, reflected in what you said earlier, where both are likely to finish in the red for the year, because we went through this pandemic uh, where the response from the Federal Reserve and the federal government was an unprecedented level of monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus. And that's been compounded by rolling supply chain issues, and then, of course, the war in, in Ukraine. So if ever there were a 500-year storm or a 100-year storm, this has been it. And the stock market not only does generally not like higher interest rates, but it certainly doesn't like precipitously higher interest rates. So it would be hard to have painted a picture that would have been more uh, 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 harsh for both stocks and bonds as the one we've had this year. Is that why oil prices are going down? Yes, I think there are a number of reasons, but that's clearly a major consideration. Number one, global economic activity is, is weakening. Number two, the second largest consumer of oil, maybe it's even the first these days, it's back and forth between the U.S. and China, but the second largest consumer of oil has had its own share of problems and the manner in which it responded to those problems. I'm referring to uh, not only the pandemic with which the rest of the world has had to deal, but the way they've responded, which uh, has been basically broad-based lockdowns. Uh, and lastly, notwithstanding the sanctions and ultimately the price cap on Vladimir Putin's oil from Russia, uh, there's been a fair amount of leakage, uh, a fair amount of uh, uh, oil still coming out, but also because two major consumers of oil, and there are other smaller ones, but China and India, have not agreed to alter their behavior at all. In fact, they're scooping up all the oil they can at discounted prices. So glad to have great friend of the show from Morgan Stanley, Jim Spiro. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're so happy to have Managing Director at Morgan Stanley. He's also Principal of the Spiro Group, Jim Spiro. We were talking about, about China, and yeah. China's been going through some bad problems with COVID. Well, right now, between Christmas and uh, mo many things, many items are made in China. Do you think this is going to be hurting for our manufacturing for maybe in the, shown in the fourth quarter, which we're going to find out in the first quarter of next year? Yeah, I think there will continue to be supply chain issues, yes, but less than we experienced in the West, because you have to realize, and a lot of this is implicit in this, is that China continues to reopen, but you have to realize that uh, their response to COVID was very different on a couple of fronts. One, it was much more aggressive in terms of the lockdowns, no question about that, but it was much, much less aggressive in terms of both fiscal and monetary stimulus. I think you will see China, if they continue to reopen, will be much more ready and able to get with the program, if you will, than we saw here in the West. And I think most of the supply chain issues that we were dealing with here in the West have greatly uh, uh, been relieved. A wonderful example is, if you recall, early this year, there were 100 some odd ships stacked up off the coast of California. That's now basically been uh, totally uh, alleviated, and the uh, uh, the, the normal uh, uh, port traffic has resumed. And one of my viewer emails, I've gotten a couple of them, but one of them said, please ask Jim this question. 
Right. But he's concerned about he's got about five hundred thousand dollars in um, in excess cash. That yeah. what he wants to do is he wants to have like a bond, either a bond ETF, a bond mutual fund, but something that pays on a continuous basis. And his concern is: should he put it in a bond muni fund? Should he put it in a bond ETF? Or what is your advice? Well, my advice is first of all, I know a, a smattering of what you're saying about this individual, but. Before I give you an answer, and I will, I don't know the individual's age. I don't know the individual's tax uh, bracket. I don't know the individual's total net worth. I don't know the individual's predilection for risk or, or lack did, thereof. Jim, he did. Uh, I apologize. He did say he's in his late sixties. Okay. Well, okay. I'm not far behind, and okay. I don't want to. And I don't want to play through either. <laughs> nothing. Uh, nothing wrong with that. But yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. But but having said that, generally uh, an approach that might be worthy of some thought. Again, whether you use tax freeze or taxable paper. That's up to the individual. But generally, you might want to look at uh, a laddered bond portfolio. This is hardly an original concept, but it's a useful one. And that's to shield yourself from the uh, inability to predict the future direction of interest rates. Nobody can do that, including the Fed. So if a person had half a million dollars to invest, what he or she could give some thought to doing, whether you want to do taxable or tax-free, you'd have to run the math, uh, is maybe you put 20 percent in a one-year, 20 in a two-year, 20 in a three-year, 20 in a four-year, and 20 in a five-year piece of paper. That's actually particularly advantageous right now because A, rates have come up a good bit, but B, as I mentioned to you, there's an inversion where after you go out a certain period of time, the rates level off and begin to come down. Uh, and if you do that, you accomplish a couple of things. One, you draw income from those securities as they generate it. Two, every year, Andre, roughly 20 percent of the portfolio, or precisely 20 percent of the portfolio, will come due, and the remaining four fifths will move up and have a year less to go in maturity. So when the first, when the, when the one-year security matures, you go out and replace the five-year that now only has four years to go, and the four and the three and the two and the one move up respectively. You've done a couple of things. You've taken away the guesswork on interest rates, and when you set up the five-year ladder, you know that if interest rates go down, okay, well, at least some of the longer maturities, the three, four, and five, you captured some of the higher yields that were available at the time the ladder was created. And if interest rates go up, you have the good fortune knowing that every year you have new money coming due that you can replace the long end of the ladder and capture the new highest interest rates or higher interest rates. So whether you go taxable or tax-free, that's a, a function that the individual needs to determine with his or her tax professional. But that's an approach where, to the best of uh, your ability, you can not only capture return, but give yourself some shielding against the unpredictable, which is the future direction of interest rates. Jim, this week in the Wall Street Journal, there was an interesting article about there was the old adage of the 4% rule when people yeah. retire. Yeah. Um, the thought is, is that if they take 4% of their portfolio for the first year to live on, that the increase will overcome that 4% that they've taken out. And yeah. then for the second year, they adjust it either up or down, whatever like that. Um, do you do you believe in the adage of of the four percent rule and um, and your thoughts on that? Well, look, it's been a, it's been quote unquote a rule. It's really a guided, a suggested course of action, but it's been around for decades. And if you go back literally a hundred years, I've seen the data. It really hasn't failed. It's gotten close a couple of times. If you look at it on rolling thirty-year periods of time, and you have to assume the individual has thirty years or so between the time of retirement and the time of of, of, of death. Even the worst rolling 30-year period over the last 100 years was the late 60s to the uh, mid to late 90s. It still worked out, or very, very, got close a couple of times, but it still worked out where you could take roughly 4% each year, uh, adjust it for inflation each year, and still not deplete your resources. But it's been a reasonably good guideline, and I don't think it's something that if I were setting up a 30-year retirement, I don't think it's something that I would put in the category of, ah, that's a bunch of old poppycock, I'm not going to deal with it anymore. Would that be one approach? And I've seen many, many more sophisticated Monte Carlo analysis and so forth. Obviously, you always run something called sequence of return risk, Andre, where if in the early portion of your retirement, markets collapse, it's a lot tougher than it happens in later years. But assuming you use a 60-40, a 70-30, 50-50 split between equities and fixed income, I think that's a reasonable guideline to consider. Yes, I do. We've only got now days until 2023. Do you believe in the Santa Claus rally? Do you think that we're going to have a, a Santa Claus rally? And 
And what is a Santa Claus rally? Well, let's take the last question first. The Santa Claus rally is generally the propensity uh, from the period of Thanksgiving to uh, Christmas, and it really goes about a week longer uh, for markets to uh, have one of their best uh, periods than, than uh, uh, the, the balance of the year. Uh, the, I, I, it's hard not to believe in that. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it the holiday rally, the Santa Claus rally, end of year rally, whatever appellation you want to use. It's hard to dispute. It's there. I can't tell you what's going to happen in the next week to two weeks, Andre. I'm not the amazing Kreskin. But I will tell you that you, you get to a point where towards the end of the year, people have taken their tax losses. Uh, they have a, want to have a fresh slate, not only literally, but emotionally. And you also get a lot of retirement injection uh, towards the end of the year in the first part of a new year. And that's an inflow of money. So I generally have found it a good time to be in the market. I'm not a timer. I don't, I don't, I don't engage in unusual behavior for the last Last couple of weeks. But do I think historically there's support for it? Yes. Jim, what a great way to end it. I, I, I hope you come back for 2023 and always love you as a friend. If you invite me, I'm, I'm like America's guest. If you invite me, I'm coming. <laughs> That's a deal. Happy holidays for you, Jim. Oh, you too, Andre. Thank you and to your viewers as well. Well, if you've got a question about finance or a comment about the show, we want to hear from you. Make it pithy and concise. Write us at Andre at WallStreetWrapUp.info. Now, let's look ahead for market information for next week. Well, on this day in 1947, scientists at Bell Labs developed what small invention that did away with vacuum tubes? We'll have the answer in just a moment. On this day in 1947, scientists at Bell Labs developed what small invention that did away with vacuum tubes? The first semiconductor. It was called the transistor. Well, no doubt you've heard of the IRS suing individuals. Now the tables are being turned. Billionaire and owner of Citadel Investments, Ken Griffin, is suing the IRS for the unlawful releasing of his tax returns and then failed to safeguard taxpayer data. Well, it was released to a publication called ProPublica from an anonymous source inside the IRS for a story on taxes paid by billionaires. The article stated from 2013 to 2018, Ken Griffin earned $1.7 billion per year. He was the second highest taxpayer in the country, and he also helped defeat a tax increase in Illinois. He since moved from Illinois and now resides in Florida, where there are no individual income taxes. Well, no comment from the IRS or Treasury Department. Department. You know, they say you can't fight City Hall. I guess with deep enough pockets, you can take on, though, the IRS. Well, join us next week when my guest will be the former Comptroller General of the country, David Walker. In addition, David was also the trustee for the Social Security and Medicare systems. We'll talk about the state of the national debt and the solvency of both the Social, Se Social Security and Medicare. That's next week, former Comptroller General of the country, David Walker. As a reminder, we repeat the show Sunday mornings, but the best way, set your DVR so you'll never miss an episode. And that's our show for this Friday, December the 16th. Hope you enjoyed it. My thanks to Managing Director at Morgan Stanley's Jim Spiro for joining us this evening. But as always, it's you. We appreciate you for allowing us into your homes tonight. Remember, follow us on all the social media on Facebook and YouTube and WYES.org. So, have a great weekend. Have a productive week as well. I'll see you next week. Remember, if it's Friday, it's Wall Street Wrap Up. I'm Andre LaVoy. Remember, money never sleeps. Good night. Sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern.